I'm Carr. Let me ask you something. Are you familiar with the concept of weekends? Five-day work weeks? The eight-hour work day? Are you happy that at the age of ten you weren't sent off to go work in a mill or a factory? Do you have black friends or black co-workers or even a black significant other or spouse? Are you allowed to get married? Do you have children together? Do those children get to go to school with other children who don't look like them? Are you gay, lesbian, bisexual, pansexual, transgender, asexual, or intersex? Do you lie in bed awake at night in fear that an ambulance will show up to your house and drag you off to the mental ward? Are you not a man and therefore unable to vote? No? Oh, and here's the big one. Do you have to swear fealty to a crown? All of these social improvements may have involved council meetings, ballot initiatives, Supreme Court rulings, or acts of Congress, but they started with riots. What if I told you that on March 5th, in an American major city, a group of laborers, small business owners, and concerned citizens took to the streets to protest against the presence of armed agents of the state? Those government agents called in backup, took up more arms, and in response to thrown rocks and snowballs, opened fire on unarmed demonstrators, killing and wounding a number of them, only to later get off with laughably reduced sentences. In case that sounded a little too similar to what's going on right now, I should inform you that this was the Boston Massacre. It took place in 1770. Sorry, I forgot the year. I think that it is a failing of our education system that we so often miss the important details of major societal changes and movements. When we are taught history in school, we are only given this vague understanding of these movements, knowing little more than the dates and that some people gave some speeches and then some benevolent white men signed some documents and everything was fixed. We get the impression that the activists, who we now know are on the right side of history, were viewed that way at the time. The reality is that the people fighting for progressive movements were often mocked, demonized, and subjected to state violence. In 1913, a women's suffrage parade took place in Washington, D.C. Drunken men were in town to attend the presidential inauguration the following day, and they began to jeer and taunt the female demonstrators as they walked down the street. Then, large groups of men began pushing into and shoving the women marching, storming onto the parade route, and burning them with lit cigars. The police failed to protect the demonstrators, and the ensuing riot required military troops to be brought in to restore order. A hearing was held, and the D.C. police chief was dismissed for negligence. This boosted the movement that would later lead to the passage of the 19th Constitutional Amendment. Stonewall was a gay bar in Manhattan and also refers to an uprising that came about as a result of the LGBTQ plus community growing tired of having to pay off cops to keep their clubs open and prevent state violence from being visited upon them. They would later draw allies from the anti-war movements and the civil rights protesters of the early 60s. Led in part by a black drag queen named Marsha P. Johnson, this was a multi-day riot. There were cop car windows smashed, buildings set on fire, they took their fight to the streets and in defiance of the hypermasculine cops and their phalanx configuration, locked arms and formed a kick line and sang show tunes to square off against government thugs. God, that's awesome. By the way, the first gay pride parade happened after that and ultimately led to the first gay and trans rights bills becoming law. Let's go back to 1886. Workers all across the colonies had been striking for several decades to push for an eight hour workday, but what turned the tide of the labor war was when on the 3rd of May, thousands of workers went to confront strike breakers at a plant in Chicago. The police arrived and, cementing their status as a tool to be used against organizing, opened fire and killed four people. The next day there was a rally to protest this violence. A bomb was detonated in Haymarket Square. Labor activists were rounded up en masse and imprisoned. A number of the movement leaders were tried, convicted, and hanged. Two years later, the American Federation of Labor decreed that American workers should not work no more than eight hours a day. The next year, this would become endorsed as the official date for demonstrations around the world, now known as May Day. On side note, it's almost as if cops aren't allies and have no place at labor or pride demonstrations. But uh, where was I? Oh, 
The civil rights era from 1940 to 1971 was marked by so many incidents of civil unrest I won't be able to list them all here. Just know that it took black activists being beaten, hosed, attacked by dogs, and gassed, and even killed in the streets before in 1964 the Civil Rights Act was signed. And even after that, many more black leaders would continue to lose their lives in the ongoing struggle against white supremacy to this day. Anything, and I do mean anything, that challenges the social, political, cultural, and economic control held by the white ruling class will be met with suppressive state violence. And at that point, the only tool that can cut through and affect real, tangible change is civil disobedience.